Um, so if you've been with us this summer, you know that we've been studying through the book of Colossians, and so far this summer in our study of Colossians, we've seen a couple of key things. We've seen that Jesus is supreme over all things, and that having trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, that we as believers are now called to grow in maturity in him. And we've seen that these two kind of foundational truths, the supremacy of Jesus, our call to to grow into maturity in him, have been repeated over and over again through the first part of this letter that Paul wrote. And that's because they are so core, so foundational, that we really don't want to miss them. Because anything in our faith as believers that doesn't ultimately rest on the singular supremacy of Jesus will ultimately produce in us something that is counterfeit in some form or fashion. If we don't have as the bedrock of our faith the the core belief that Jesus is God incarnate, that he is fully a representation of who God is because he is God himself and that everything is for him and through him and to him and he is supreme over all things, then, then anything we build on top of that will be lacking and so we've seen that over and over and over again. And so this morning as we continue, we're going we're gonna to begin to see what happens when that does not become the bedrock. What happens when instead of having as the foundation this core belief in the supremacy of Jesus, instead we filter in and we bring into that mix things which are ultimately seemingly true or veiled in truth, but in reality are deceptive lies. Before we do that this morning, I'll share a, um, a, a story with you. The, uh, the year before, Sheridan and I had our oldest, Micaiah. We lived just outside of Austin. We lived right out on Lake Travis. It's a great place to live. Had a fantastic time. And so we, we decided that summer that we would invite all of my family to come down and do summer vacation in Austin. We had some ministry friends that had a ski boat, a couple jet skis, um, and they were going to let us use it for a week, which was great. So we we're going to go out and we're going to go water skiing. We're going to go tubing. We're going to go try to fling one another off the back of the jet ski. Uh, we're going to watch the sun go down over the lake. We just had this, this whole fantastic trip plan. There's a little nine-hole hill country golf course right out there in the neighborhood. We're going to go play golf one day. And so we invite everyone in my family to come down. And they all say, yeah, that sounds great. We're going to come down. We're going to spend the time in Austin. We're going to have an, an awesome vacation there. We're going to get a lake house. And, and so everything is lined out and ready to go. And so Sheridan and I are thinking, as we're getting ready for this trip and thinking about the accommodations, we're going, man, we'd really like to get some extra time with, with the family. And so even though we had our own place in town, we decide, well, one of those evenings, we're going to just go bunk at the lake house with everybody else. And that way we can stay up late. And once parents go to bed, I can hang out with my brothers and we can sit out on the deck and we can talk and, and just enjoy this lake vacation. And so... Um, we get all geared up and ready to go, and our accommodations for the evening at the lake house were, were an air mattress in this big, massive open loft. Now, I don't know about you, but at some point in time in your adult life, sleeping on an air mattress no longer becomes an option you're willing to tolerate or accommodate. You just go, nah, it's fine. I'll, I'll just go get a hotel or and we're not going to come, right? At some point in time, you've all made that decision, right? You've been like, it's, it's air mattress or I'm not even, like, I'm not even coming. It's just not going to work. So this weekend was that decision point for me, right? From that moment forward, there's no more. I, I just, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to sleep on an air mattress, right? Because we, we go to bed that evening. We're tired. We've had a long day out in the sun. We've been playing on the water. We've been having a great time. And we go up to this loft, and this air mattress looks full, structurally sound, ready to embrace Two sleeping people, and you know where the story is going, right? At two o'clock in the morning, we wake up, and it's flat as a pancake. And you know at that point, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Because it doesn't matter if you reinflate the thing, you're going to be sitting there going, okay, how long is it going to be until I feel the, the low parts of my body touching the floor while everything else is kind of sagging in this wobbly air mattress, right? You know that, right? And so at that point, we're done. I don't think we slept the rest of the night. And we we're so delirious. Like, neither one of us thought, hey, our place is 10 minutes away. Let's just, let's just get in the car and go back to our air-conditioned house with, with our own bed. No, we didn't do that. 
Um, so the air mattress, right? That was the weekend that we decided we were not going to do air mattresses anymore. So why do I tell you that story? Because we were trusting this air mattress to stay inflated, but somewhere along the way, its integrity had been compromised, right? There were holes somewhere in it that had been poked that, that were seemingly so small and insignificant that we didn't even notice and it wasn't until we, we put weight upon that air mattress that we began to realize that this is something that no longer held up. And so as we come to Colossians chapter 2 today, I want you to keep that imagery in mind because that's exactly the danger that Paul is going to communicate to us here from the world, from the Word. He's going to say to us that the world around us is not passive. There's no shortage of lies or deceitful arguments or spiritual attacks or false religious principles and, and things that are out there. And that, that if we embrace them, if we embrace them, even if they seem seemingly small and insignificant, they risk letting the air out of our faith and causing it to go flat. It becomes something that you don't stand on. It becomes something that doesn't support its weight. It becomes something that looks to be full, but in reality has been compromised with things which ultimately don't hold air. And we still experience this dynamic today, don't we, church? This isn't just something that's unique for, for the Colossians. It's not something that Paul is writing to that we go, man, it must have really stunk to live in that time where you, where you live in a world where people are trying to insert lies and falsehoods and, and different things into belief, right? We still experience that dynamic today because the world around us is searching for truth and searching for meaning in everything other than the person and work of Jesus. But the good news for us today is that we're not only given warning and encouragement about how to steer clear of those things that want to compromise the integrity of our faith, but we also trust in a Savior who is able to fix even those things that have been broken and fill us with the person and work of Jesus as we trust in him. So take a look with me now at Colossians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 6, read through verse 7 to start, and we'll begin to see this dynamic at play here in this letter. Paul starts and says, Therefore... As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. First thing I want you to see from the Bible this morning is that a firm faith, a firm faith is rooted in Christ. What do I mean by that? Look back at these two verses with me, All right? We just saw back in, in chapter 1. This past week when we were there, that the aim of understanding the gospel is not just to know Christ, but also to grow into maturity in him, right? We don't just receive Christ as a get out of hell free card, but we look to Jesus as the beginning and the end. He's not just the foundation, he's the frame, he's the structure, he's the completed picture. We are being built up into the image of Christ, and so we, we look at Jesus and, and we say, you know, in, in light of this, in light of this truth, we, we don't just believe the gospel as, as a starting and ending point. We believe the gospel as our foundation. And then from there, we grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and we become more like him and we see him for who he is. And we, in our character and in our words and in our lives, we become more like the person of Jesus and so in light of that, we see here that because of and, and in light of those things, just as we've received Jesus as the Lord, we walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. Now, I want to point out a couple things to you here. First, I want you to see what it says of Jesus in verse 6. It says, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord. It says, Jesus is Lord, right? The idea of the lordship of Jesus is that he is not only our Savior, He is our Savior, but He's not only our Savior, He also is Lord. He rightfully rules over us. We saw back in, in chapter 1, right? We saw He is the firstborn over all creation. He's the head over the church. He's the image of the invisible God. So, so we don't just come to the Word. We don't just open up our Bibles and go, well, these are some nice suggestions on how to live a good life, a moral life. We don't just open up the word and go, these are, these are options for me to choose if I want to. 
And we open up the Word and we see that Jesus calls us to a life of obedience. Obedience to the Word. Obedience to Him. Following His direction and His guidance. And, and, and the result of that is, is both pleasing to Him and it's good for us. When he tells us what is right and good and what we should do and what we shouldn't do and when he tells us what faithfulness looks like and when he tells us how we ought to love our spouse and how we ought to treat our children or students who are in here, how to love your siblings or honor your parents or what you should value with your treasure, your money, your time, the valuable things that God has given you. When he speaks to those things, He he has a right to tell us what to do. And if we understand the glory of who Jesus is and we believe that, then listen to me, church. We're not missing out on anything. We're not missing out on anything. If if we say, I humbly submit to what you say, Jesus. I want to obey your word. I want to do what you call me to do. That's literally the best possible outcome for us. Right? Right? I don't know about you, but but for the creator of the universe to show up to a guy who gets overwhelmed trying to organize his Thursday and say, I want to tell you how to live in such a way that is pleasing to me and good for you, the answer to that for me is yes, Lord. Amen. Now, some of you may be crushing your 5, 10, uh, 15-year goals, and this doesn't apply to you, but for all the rest of us, Man, that's great news this morning that Jesus is Lord, that he rightfully rules over us, that he cares so deeply that we would live our lives before him, that he tells us how to do so with joy, with happiness, with security. But what else does it say here? Jesus is Lord, but having received him as Lord, do what? What does it say? It says, walk in him. That phrase, walk in him, literally means continue to live your life in him. In other words, you don't start with Jesus and then graduate to something that's better or smarter or wiser. Jesus isn't the base model, and then you, some time down the road, add some features in in order to get a better religious experience. No, the idea is simply to remain where you are, which is where? In him. Remain in him. Walk in him, rooted and established in the faith, just as you were taught. You know, right after Hurricane Ike, Sheridan and I went over to uh, the Beaumont area. We did a week of uh, mission work over in Beaumont. Um, For those of us in Houston, if you were here when Ike rolled through, you know, obviously Ike was a huge deal in Houston. We took the, the brunt of Ike coming through as well. But what many people didn't realize when we were dealing with, with the consequences of Ike here is that that Ike also blew through and, and created a ton of damage in Beaumont. And just two years prior, they had been hit with Hurricane Rita. And so I remember we were there. We were talking to one of the guys who was leading the crews that were going out and mucking out homes. And he was telling us about the trees because there was an incredible, incredible amount of tree damage in Beaumont. And so we were talking with him and he said, you know, the reason that there are so many downed trees in Beaumont is because when Rita blew through the area, we got one side of the storm, and so all the, all the weak trees blew one direction, and then when Ike blew through, we got the other side of the storm, and so they all blew back the other direction, and so all the, the weak trees that didn't have strong roots, they just snapped, and so there's trees everywhere. And so we would go along, and we would see that. You'd see these trees laying everywhere, and then in the midst of all of the chaos of these fallen trees, you would see these hardy, deep, thick, old, established trees that were just standing firm. And you could see them easily because all the other trees around them that weren't established had all fallen down. And, and so I want you to keep that image in mind as we talk about this here because these trees whose roots were deep in the soil It didn't matter which way the wind was blowing, they remained firm. And so similarly for us, when when Paul says here to to walk in Jesus, rooted and built up in him, he's saying that a, a firm faith builds deep roots right where it started, which is in Christ. 
And, and that matters, right, at the outside of what we're about to read here because we're going to encounter different things in, in, in looking at Colossians chapter 2. Church, we as we go out into the world, we're going to encounter different things that test the conviction and the integrity of our faith. We're going to hear things from culture or from people around us that want to push back like strong winds against the, the belief that we have that Jesus is sufficient, that the Bible is truth. And that somehow, if, if we cling fast to this, we're not missing out on something. And whether or not we're firmly planted in the word and firmly planted in Christ matters. Matters that we can trust and, and believe that we can aim no higher than to be in Christ. It matters that we, we look at the command to walk in him and we say, that's my highest ideal. I shouldn't look elsewhere. I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything else than, than walk in him. I'm not missing out on life. I'm not, I'm not missing something. I'm not burying my head in the sand by being dogmatic about trusting Jesus and taking his word at face value and letting it guide and orchestrate my life and my values and my thoughts and what it is that I choose to prioritize. Where do you find yourself with that this morning? Are you being more informed about what to believe and how to act because of your social media account, your students, your friends at school, or your particular brand of talk radio or the opinion of friends and family? Or are you walking in Jesus rooted and built up in him? Because as already mentioned, the world is not passive toward us. What do I mean by that? Let's take a look and see how that begins to play out here looking at verses 8 through 10. So having established that, that we're rooted in Christ, we now see how we can fall victim to falsehoods and ideas that disrupt our faith. Look at, look at verse 8 with me. It says there, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him... The fullness, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Uh, earlier this summer, right, right before uh, school let out, um, we took a family vacation over to Atlanta, and then we surprised our kids with a, a beach trip to Panama City Beach. And so we get there, uh, it was a Wednesday afternoon, we get to the beach, we get there around dinner time. And we're all excited. We're like, hey, let's go run out to the beach. Let's go run out to the beach. And so we got to the beach, and there are two red flags that have been hoisted up, a flagpole and a, flame, a plane flying by, you know, with a big banner behind it. It says, rip currents. <laughs> Don't get in the water. My girls are like, what's a rip current? I'm like, okay, teachable moment. We're going to talk about rip currents here. Apparently, we're not going to talk about what a great time we had swimming in the ocean because we don't want to get sucked out into the ocean and die. So, cool, we're going to talk about rip currents, right? So, if you're not familiar with what a rip current is or a rip tide, what they are is they're these, these strong currents that, that will literally suck you out into the ocean. And they're so strong, if you try to swim against them, it's completely futile, right? Now, there's ways to swim out of a rip current, right? You swim parallel to the shore. So if you're like, oh my God, I don't want to get stuck in a rip current and die in the ocean. Okay, there's ways around it, right? But there are these, these currents that literally will pull you out in the ocean. They're so strong. If you try to just swim straight back to shore, you'll never do it. You'll just tire yourself out and drown. And so they literally take you captive. And so my older girls were asking about it. They were like, well, can you see a rip current? And is it you know, how do you know to not get in one? And so we, so we had the conversation we talked about, okay, here's how you see a rip current. Here's what it is. Here's what it looks like. And here's why we don't go swimming when there's rip currents out there because, you know, we just want to be extra careful and extra sure. Um, but that's the idea that we see here in the text, right? Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. He's saying that there are lies, there are untruths, that the world puts out there that, that should you choose to swim into them will take you captive. If you don't spot them for what they are. And so stay away. See to it. Perception. Watch for these things. Be careful 
that you don't just mindlessly wander into these things which want to take you captive and pull you into them. Right? What is, so what does that mean here? Don't be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Listen, church, it is baked into our nature as people. If you survey the world around you, this is true across every generation, every culture, every worldview. It is baked into our nature as people to seek to know and understand truth, meaning, and the purpose for our existence. Do you believe that this morning? That, that you've been wired, you've been created in such a way that you desire to know truth and meaning and the purpose for your existence. Of course, we know as followers of Jesus that that's because we've been created by Creator God who made us in His image, who created us to know Him and in knowing Him understand that all truth and meaning and purpose flows from Him and that our chief aim, our primary purpose as people created in the image of God is to glorify Him. We know that to be true. But what happens if you're a person who rejects the idea that God exists. What is truth then? What is meaning? What is our purpose for existence? To answer that question, you end up with philosophy. The search for truth. And listen, there have been philosophers and different prevalent philosoph philosophical ideas across every culture, every era of mankind, but especially in the day that Paul and the Colossians are living. When you think about philosophers, right, you probably think of Greek philosophers. You've got Socrates and Plato, Aristotle. These guys all lived within 200 to 400 years before the time that Paul is writing. Their ideas came just across the sea from Greece. They've all been exported into this area where this little town of Colossae is. These are prevalent ideas. They're the, the worldview through which many people there are, are still choosing to live. Right? We talked about when we were introing the book of Colossians that this place is kind of a, a melting pot. There's a massive Jewish exodus, a planting of people there. And so around this time, around the, the first century BC, you're starting to get Jewish rabbis who are compiling their teachings. And so you've got Jewish rabbinical schools of thought. You're now getting great Roman philosophers who are speaking, and all these things are, are merging together in this mixing pot called Asia Minor. But the core principle among all of these ideas, all of these philosophies that are out there, is to answer the questions, what is truth? What is meaning? What is our purpose? But if you look back at verse 8, what is it according to? According to human tradition according to elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Well, we see here that, that Paul is saying, be careful, be careful not to be taken captive by these things is a simple truth that underlies all philosophical systems and explanations that are not built at Christ, which is that at the core, they're founded on the belief that in man's highest understanding of truth, meaning, and purpose and the ideas and the systems or traditions that come from that, or because of demonic work in the world, when it talks about elemental spirits there, it's talking about demonic work, spiritual work, worldly things that are going on, that there is an adequate answer for what is truth, what is meaning, what is our purpose. Consider the major religions of the world. You think about the origins of major religions. Hinduism, right, in this, in this river valley, a group of social elites create a construct called the caste system. And this becomes the, the bedrock of their religion. A bunch of people who had status and position organize a religion in which they become the elite. They become the, the overarching hierarchical structure and people who don't have what they have fall into categories beneath them. Buddhism comes out of Hinduism. Confucianism Taoism, built on the philosophies of Confucius and Lao Tzu, right? What about Islam? Prophet Muhammad is visited by the angel Gabriel. We know no angel, Scripture tells us, 
is going to preach a gospel, anything other than the gospel of Jesus. Clearly, this is demonic. Angel Gabriel shows up and tells Muhammad all the things that would be written in the Quran. Mormonism, Joseph Smith, visited by the angel Moroni, who reveals to him new teachings and golden plates, which he transcribes. All of these religions that, that have captivated billions of people around the world and said, this is how you should view the world. This is truth. This is the reason for your existence. This is the purpose for which we are here. Are all based on human tradition or demonic work. And they've led billions of people astray into something which is no longer true. A false understanding of who God is and how we live our lives and what we must do to please him. They've been taken captive. What about today? The philosophy of our age has largely been science, right? Science, we're told, explains the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of man, defines what our purpose is and what truth is and what's not. It says, hey, we're here by chance. There's no reason for you to exist. There's no reason for us to exist. Cosmos just happened to create this world that we're on and happened to be the right conditions for life to exist. And billions of years of evolution and change just happened to cause us to, to rise up and, and now exist as the most evolved form of animal that's out there. But on a DNA level, we're not really a whole lot different than the other animals out there. And so we have this sense of right and wrong, not, not because there's, there's a truth that exists out there that, that we align our lives according to, but, but we as people and, and societies, we've defined over time what's right and what's wrong, and so that can change. If we all decide that something else should be true, morals are social constructs by group consensus. It's the philosophy of our age. It says God's not the answer to anything. So we have to come up with theories and laws and explanations for everything. And listen, not all science is bad, right? It's not all lies. If science uncovers a truth that's out there, that exists within the world, that exists within the universe, right? The scientist says there's a natural explanation for this because there is no God, no creator. And as a believer in Jesus, we look at that thing and we say, well, all truth is God's truth. So this is evidence for the brilliance of a creator, you know, the scientist looks at the, the intricacies of DNA and says, this happened by chance over time because of evolution. And we look at it and go, how brilliant is God? How incredible is, how incredible is our Father? How magnificent are the wonders and the works of his hands? I was talking with the girls on the way back from San Antonio, the trip I was telling you about on Friday. And they said, you know, Dad, are there other, is, is there... Are we ever going to discover life on another planet? Why, why does life exist on this planet and nowhere else? And I'll save you the, the long conversation. I said, but the, but the scientist says to that, well, there's no reason for life here. There's no reason for it. It just happened. And so because it's all just chance, maybe there is life on another planet. And I'm not saying there is or isn't. But I'm saying if we understand the Bible, we understand the reason for life and existence isn't because life and existence just happened by chance. It's because God decreed that it would take place. So our search for meaning and our search for life and our search for, for anything else that might be out there, as a believer, we sit back and we go, ultimately, anything that exists is for the glory of God. So we don't need to find something out there as though that's going to help us understand life or meaning any better because we understand it's ultimately about him in the first place. So we're not on a search to understand why we exist. We already know the answer. And totally, fundamentally changes the way that we see things. But even science now is slowly being replaced with the philosophy of experience. You've seen this, right? The philosophy of personal or corporate experience. Truth. Meaning, purpose, is what you experience. Your reality is whatever you think it is, or whatever you think it ought to be, or what the majority of people decide is true. You don't have to have proof or reasoning for that. Truth can be whatever you want it to be. Listen, whatever the philosophy is, 
It exists, hear me, because people are trying to make sense of life by suggesting that there's an answer we can figure out on our own because Christ is not the answer. God does not exist. But what does the Bible say about these ideologies? What does it say in verse 8? They're empty. They're empty. They're not based on Christ, in whom, as verse 9 says, the fullness of deity, everything that we could know about the divine, the otherworldly, the, the, the reason for our existence, they're not based in Jesus, in whom the fullness of deity dwells, and who is head and, and ruler over all rule and all authority, even the angels and the demons. In other words, the lie of philosophy is that there's no truth to be found in God because he doesn't exist, when in reality, there's no truth outside of him. He is the source of truth. And so we aren't taken captive by arguments and philosophies of this world that try to make sense of things outside of Christ that tell us what we must value and what we must care about, that maybe even tolerate our belief in Christ and say, it's fine if you want to be a Christian, but you also have to believe this, or it's fine that you follow Jesus, but you can't deny this other thing. Listen, church, we've already said it, but the world is not passive toward us, especially in today's age. So do you believe, as we saw last week in chapter one, that wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus? Do you understand and believe that the beliefs of this age, decades from now, centuries from now, people will look back at the things that we espoused in 2022 and say, how foolish those people were to believe those things because we are so much more enlightened now about what is really true and how we really ought to believe and, and what our meaning really is. There's nothing new under the sun. And look, we're not called to bury our heads in the sand, but to realize that even the most cunning and skillful arguments presented to us don't change the undeniable, unchanging truth of Christ. Our Bibles hold up to scrutiny. Belief in Jesus holds up to scrutiny. The claims of the Bible, the testimony about Jesus are, are arguably the most reliable and well-documented fact that we have in the history of the world. And so we're not thrown off by arguments or lies that we see around us that want to ground truth in something other than Scripture. We don't jump just because the world says to jump. We don't take arguments that we hear around us at face value without questioning them. We use the truth of Scripture. We use the truth that God made and created all things for his honor and glory. We use the truth that man outside of Jesus is fallen and sinful by nature and lives out of a fallen and sinful nature. We use the truth that through Jesus, anything that has been broken and made counterfeit in this world can be redeemed. We use all of those things to make sense of the world around us to make sense of what we believe because they ultimately lead us back to the source of all truth, which is God himself. So we're not taken captive. Why can we be so confident in these things? Why can we be so confident in these things? Why can I stand here this morning and be so confident in that truth? The answer is what we see in the end of this passage, and it's this. We can be confident in these things because we understand that among the things that Jesus did by saving us from our sin is lifting us out of a place of captivity. We're not taken captive because we understand that at one time we were captive. We're not bought into the, the lies and the deceitful things that we see in the world around us because we understand that at one point in time that was the only world we knew. Following the prince of the power of the air, as Ephesians 2 says, living in darkness, not knowing the truth, but now we've seen the glorious light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus, and it fundamentally transforms everything. So we're not drawn to go back to things that smell like the world and the sinful nature and the lies that Jesus redeemed us from when we were captive. He rescued and redeemed us that we might now see all things through the lens of Christ. Look at verses 11 through 15 with me. We can be confident in these things because it says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, 
having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The third and final thing I want you to see this morning is that a firm faith rests in Christ's work on our behalf, right? Paul talks here about circumcision. In the Old Testament, circumcision was given as a sign, right? A sign saying, these are the people of God. They're marked. They're outwardly different. They've been made clean. But no amount of external change can produce what God ultimately desires, which is not behavior modification, physical change. What God desires is a clean heart, a renewed spirit. Through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, this teaches us here that Jesus accomplished the intention of circumcision, which was to create a covenant people for himself, whose change was not outwardly done in the flesh, but inwardly done in the, the flesh that resides within us, the, the inner man, the sinful nature inside of us that is leaning constantly toward doing what we feel is right instead of trusting in Jesus. Saying on the cross, Jesus severed that, that flesh on the inside that we might live for Christ. But this is not strictly about thus having a people who've been saved because the problem of our sin is not just about us. It's also about the fact that you've got a holy and a just God who must bring consequence for sin. And so we get this beautiful picture, look back at verse 13 with me, that not only in Jesus have we been made clean, but that our debt has also been paid. Look there. It says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. All. Past, present, the sin you're struggling with as you sit there today and you think about what entangles you and causes you to live with guilt and fear. Those sins, future, says he's forgiven you for those things. They don't have a right to, to hold you captive any longer. Jesus saved you that you might walk in liberty and no longer be enslaved to those things. But how did he forgive our trespasses? Did he just look the other way? Did he hit a reset button? No, look at verse 14. He says he canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Listen, church, every sin that you and I have committed, are committing, will commit, have piled up a massive debt against God that could never be paid. Not by you, not by me, not by a million years of good debts. Jesus paid the debt we owe. Jesus satisfied the demands of God's law that say that he must punish sin if he's going to be righteous and just. And he did it by taking the punishment on himself on the cross. Only one as rich in righteousness as Jesus could ever satisfy the debt of unrighteousness that we owe. And he did so, verse 15, to the shame and the mockery of the rulers and the authorities, which in this context is the power of Satan and demons at work in the world, because it meant game over for them. There's no more power in the philosophy of this age for those in Christ. There's no more power in the sinful nature that's been cut away inside of you if you're in Christ. There's no more believing the lies of guilt and shame that Satan may want to throw at you that lodge deep in your soul that say, I'm not worthy and I can't be forgiven and I've done too much wrong and how could God ever love me? Those lies that the evil one wants to plant in your heart that keep you from running freely to Jesus have been disarmed at the cross. Because there on the cross, at full display before the world is the IOU that our debt has caused with our names scribbled in ink at the bottom of it, nailed to the cross with the words paid in full written in the blood of Jesus. That's the truth we celebrate this morning. That's why we can say that we're not taken captive by the, what the world wants to say to us because we've tasted and seen something far greater, which is the deep, unchanging, 
all-encompassing forgiveness of our sin by our Savior Jesus. So we don't long for what the world tells us is true. We don't long to buy into what the world says we must value and trust and think because we've tasted something far better. I'll close with this. So I was thinking about this, this truth and how it rich it is for us to walk in the freedom that comes from not, lo- not being guilty over our sin anymore, but having the debt canceled. I was reminded of a song by um, Christian artist Shane and Shane. They came out with this about 15 years ago. I remember we heard this in a concert that they gave, and Shane Bernard, the, the guy who wrote it, said he, he wrote this song during a time of depression and spiritual attack and just feeling like he was constantly being told that he wasn't worthy, that he couldn't be pleasing to God. And he wrote this song called Embracing Accusations. The song goes like this. It says, could the father of lies be telling the truth of God to me tonight? If the penalty of sin is death, then death is mine. I hear him saying, cursed are the ones who can't abide. Hallelujah. He's right. The devil is preaching the song of the redeemed that I am cursed and gone astray I cannot gain salvation. Why can he say hallelujah over that? Because he knows what it is that we just read here in Colossians. That the firmness of his faith is not dependent on his behavior. It's not dependent on his ability to be perfect. It's not dependent on his ability to know all things or his ability to stop sinning or his righteousness or anything else he can do. His his faith, the firmness of his faith, rests in Christ's work on his behalf. And so the song closes, the devil is singing over me, an age-old song that I'm cursed and gone astray, singing the first verse so conveniently over me, but he's forgotten the refrain, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That's our hope as well. Rooted in Christ, unfazed by the empty promises of the wisdom of this world, that we rest in this good news, this truth, He canceled our debt that we might live to him as people freely embraced by our Father. Let's pray.